have a gut feeling that if I were to ask you on a scale of one to ten, one being the lowest, ten being highly likeliest or most important, one being least important, ten being most important, um, how important is it to you, how important is uh, prayer for your relationship with God? All right, we've got some people just shouting out numbers. Anybody else? How important is it for you and your relationship with God on a scale of 1 to 10? Um, and then I have another question, a follow-up question to that. Um, how, how satisfied are you with your prayer life on a scale of 1 to 10? How satisfied are you? If you're anything like me or I think like most people, many of us are saying inside, it's, it's definitely like maybe a five to a ten. Like prayer is very important. But then whenever you list how satisfied you are, it's more like a one to five. You're not very satisfied with your prayer life. So we're starting a series today called Jesus Praise. And you might be thinking in your heart, why should we pray if it brings me such dissatisfaction? Well, we pray because Jesus does. Jesus prays. And if you've entered into this space and you know prayer is important, but in your life you're highly dissatisfied in it, I want to let you know something Jesus can teach you. Jesus can teach you how to pray. Jesus can help you to pray. Will you stand with me? I want us to read some scripture today together, beginning in Luke chapter 11, and then we'll jump to Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus talks about prayer. Will you please help me this morning by reading aloud the words that are in yellow? But first, Let me offer a prayer so that we can receive God's word. Holy Father, I thank you so much for your son and for your spirit. Father, for Jesus who prays, for your spirit who leads us into prayer. And Father, may we open our hearts to you today. Father, may we not come to you with shame about our dedication to you, but Lord, may we come to you with a hopeful expectation that you can increase our desire, our affections for you that you can allow us to see that you are near us today. It's not a performance today. We sit in a posture of learning. We want to know you more. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. And all together we say, amen, amen. Luke 11, beginning in verse 1, this is the word of God for the people of God. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples to pray. So they had seen Jesus doing something. They wanted to have what Jesus had. And they knew that John had been teaching his disciples. He said, Jesus, Jesus, teach us. Come in here today with a posture that says, Jesus, teach me. Jesus, guide me. Jesus, lead me. And you know what? Jesus will provide for you today. Then Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, Jesus teaches on prayer. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into a room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, godless people, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Here's my first point today, okay? Lean in on this. I really want you to hear this. Accept this. Embrace this, please. Embrace this. Prayer is not something you have to be perfect at, but present for. Prayer is not something you have to be perfect at, but present for. Because I believe that prayer is this linchpin discipline. Now, I know discipline may be a strong word for some, but does it really invoke like affection, right? But prayer is a posture. Prayer is an acceptance, an embrace, a release of all that God has for you. A prayer is a release of all the life and power that we want to be filled with from God. Like our, our vision here at our church is to be filled with all the life and power that comes from God. And the way that we access that is through prayer. And the Apostle Paul talks about the Christians at the Ephesus church putting on the full armor of God. Do you know how they put on the full armor of God to protect themselves from the devil's schemes, from his arrows, temptations, and sin? Through prayer. Prayer is the linchpin habit. It is that practice of presence that allows us to experience all the joy that God has for us and to witness all the blessings that he has for you. Prayer releases the kingdom. Prayer releases God's will. Prayer releases thanksgiving in your heart. Prayer releases you from temptation. Prayer releases God's glory and honor. Prayer recognizes God's forgiveness and allows you to forgive others. This is the Lord's Prayer. Recently, I went to Joe and Jan Pickard's 45th wedding anniversary at their home. And it was a big deal. They had a band there. There were hundreds of their friends there, it seemed like. And Joe had asked me to come to his house so that I could pray, pray a prayer of thanksgiving over the food and also to provide a marital blessing for them in front of all their family and friends. And so I, I gave my prayer. And then Joe's brother-in-law, who is a Catholic priest, gave, offered a blessing over the family as well. And then we all ate together. And I spent a lot of time talking with Joe's brother-in-law, the priest, and Joe. And, and Joe also had a, a rapper come and rap at his uh, wedding anniversary. It blew my mind. I was like, Joe, I didn't know this about you, that you enjoy hip-hop. But Joe had this guy rap, too. And we were just all conversing. And there was a long line going toward the catered meal. And and I was like, well, I don't want to exit this conversation. And plus, you know how it is sometimes with the lines long, you don't want to wait in the line. And so I waited until the line dissipated. And then I went to go get my food. Well, when I got there, everybody was very celebratory because there was no food left. Um, I walked up and the lady was like rationing food. You know what I mean? Like, like, like cutting sliders in half. No, I'm kidding. But I mean, like she was like rationing food. I got the last, I got the last hamburger slider. And I, I went down a bit and I saw what used to be salmon, but it was just the skin. <laughs> and then buried under some garnish was one peel and eat shrimp. One peel and eat shrimp was left. I moved that garnish out of the way and I, I got had those tongs and, 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 I, and I went to grab it and I actually I touched it with it. And then there was a lady that was right here. She was right right behind me in line. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe, she, maybe she deserves that shrimp more than me. This lady just saw me pray. <laughs> this lady just heard me introduced as 
Joe and Jan's pastor, this lady has seen me. She knows what I do. This is all going through my mind right now. And so I turn to the lady and I say, it's one last piece of shrimp. You can have it. And there was no negotiation, you know. No, no, you have it. No, I insist. She just said, thank you so much. She took that last piece of shrimp. So I had to walk away with my one hamburger slider. And I'm just looking at everybody else's plates, you know, with all the leftovers. But I I, I tell you this story because I wish I was motivated by the fact that I, I just simply wanted to share with this woman. But what was motivating me to give up that shrimp was, how will I be seen What will she think of me? There's a book that I read that helps to combat against that. It's called God Over Good. And the premise of the book is we choose God over our own goodness. In that moment, I chose my own good, I believe, over God. I wanted to be seen doing good. And maybe y'all can connect with that. Sometimes we want to do things not because if only we were all altruistic in our motives and what we did, right? But sometimes we want to do things just to be seen doing them. Can, can I get, does that sometimes hit y'all? Do y'all do that sometimes? I'm, I'm not the only one, right? Sometimes we want to be seen doing good. We want to be seen practicing our faith. We want to be seen. And Jesus says to them about prayer. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, he says. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues, he says. And on the street corners, why? To be seen by others. But when you pray, he says, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Here's what Jesus teaches us about prayer. There is a time, a place, and a posture to prayer. There's a time, a place, and a posture to prayer. That time is when. Time is whenever. That's what Jesus says. Whenever, when. It's continual when you pray. In fact, one of Jesus' disciples says it this way. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray continually. When should we pray? Continually. When should we give our affections to God? Always. When you pray, then you are to have this mentality of, I'm not doing it for someone to see me. You can be seen praying, but I'm not to pray to be seen. You notice the difference? So Jesus says, it's most important for you to go away so that the only person that sees is God. Like what's, what's most important about our life is that we are seeking to enjoy God. We are seeking the affections and the pleasure of God. We only want Him. And so Jesus says to go to a place. So the time is whenever. And he says the place is your room, a private place, a secret place. Some translations say an internal chamber. Here's why this is important. Prayer includes a physical place plus the heart space, okay? A a prayer that is an enlivening prayer that's focused on God is a is these two components it has to have these two components the physical place and the heart space in other words get your heart alone with god it's it's you and god get your heart alone to god that the internal chamber 
I think is a metaphor for what's actually happening here in the life of somebody who's seeking the pleasure and enjoyment of God. It's the heart space. That, that room is, is like a metaphor. It is, like a, it, is, it is something that's pointing us to the internal person. Today in our Bible class that Carl Helms was teaching, we talked about that, some of the superficiality of our modern-day trends that we are experiencing today, like, like influencers or somebody who's simply famous for being famous. That, that's my words, not Carl's. But fame is given to somebody who... It doesn't matter how they came into fame, but then they leveraged that fame to become more famous. There's, what did they do? Well, they, they got famous. What are they doing now? They're, they're increasing their fame. That's it. That's, that's what is happening in modern day. Does that make sense? There's no substance to their fame. Right? I'm not trying to judge them or anything. I'm just pointing out an obser- observation that we have seen. And so for us, there has to be substance to our faith. Our faith cannot only exist in the presence of men and women. Our faith has to exist in the private place, in the closet, in the bedroom, in your home, in your car. That private place, it has to exist there. And dare I say, that's indicative of where it should exist ultimately in your home heart that it exists in the inner chambers of your heart for us to war against the temptations to be seen doing good we have to build up our inner person and the way that we build up our inner person is with God God strengthens us from the inside out that we only seeking his face so that he can activate our heart space you have to get alone you have to have that physical place in the heart space jesus tells this about the kingdom in luke chapter 17 he says once on being asked by the pharisees when the kingdom of god would come jesus replied the coming of the kingdom of god is not something that can be observed nor will people say here it is or there it is because The kingdom of God is within you. Other translations say the kingdom of God is in your heart. A lot of people were trying to define the kingdom of God with boundary lines. Like the kingdom of God's in this country or the kingdom of God's in this province. The kingdom of God is in the temple. The kingdom of God is... But Jesus said, no, the kingdom is within you. And that's where God builds you. That's where he gives you his best. So Jesus says there's a time and a place, but there's also a posture. Because the physical place nurtures a posture of humility and dependence fully on God. If you were here at the beginning of service, you may have seen that we read the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And in that parable, or you see... A Pharisee is confident. It says he looks down on everyone else. So these two men go to the temple to pray. A Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself, which sounds good, right? Away from everyone, stood by himself and prayed. Where he is sounds good, but the prayer is not right. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not a a robber or an evildoer. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even like this tax collector over here. So he's even like naming somebody in proximity. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. He's like, God, thanks for maybe just getting me over the ledge. Probably could have done it myself, right? I'm that good a person. I've done all these things for you. But the tax collector, the word says, stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
the tax collector, right? And the Pharisee. The Pharisee has the time whenever he might even have the place stood apart from everyone. But he didn't have the heart space. I mean, you can go in your room, but if the heart space isn't there, then it's not there. It needs to be something that's activated by the Holy Spirit in your life. It's, that heart space is what you desire. Like, like you can get some things functionally right, but still have the wrong mindset when you approach God. Like you could still go in your prayer closet or go in your room and you could still compare yourself with other people and try and define your holiness by how you're not like somebody else. That could probably still happen. But we have to remember that the desire is that God and his kingdom dwell in us and that we want to resemble that in our desires when we pray. And so God, when we go into that place, he can activate something new in us to help us to approach him in a place of humility and dependence on him like this tax collector god have mercy on me a sinner and jesus says that this man rather than the other went home justified before god for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted this man that activated his heart space through the power of God. This man was humble before him. Jesus says time and place and posture, and the posture is humility. And Jesus says when you have that humility, you only seek the reward of God, but those who seek to be self-righteous, then, he says, they have received the reward in full. What is the reward that Jesus is talking about. I think sometimes maybe I have been guilty of this, and I don't think this is necessarily 100% wrong, um, but this is sometimes how we talk about anything that we're attempting to do, whether it be prayer or service or taking communion or worshiping in song. Like it, it, it can just couple with this. Um, we often say things like this How? We ask this question, how can I get more of God? Right? More of you, Jesus, more of you. Right? We sing that song. It's beautiful. I love that song too. We're we're always talking about like, God, can I get more of you? How can I get more of you? Will prayer give me more of you? But I want to reframe that a little bit. Instead of how can I get more of God, how can God get more of me? How can I give myself more to God? Because God doesn't just partition himself out, like kind of divvy himself out in small portions to you. God says, I've given all to you. I've given my whole son to you. I've given my life to you through my son. Like I I give all that I have to you. I give you my my spirit to you. I give my spirit to you. Not just a little bit of thimble of the spirit. I I give you all of me, God says. God gives all of himself. So instead of how can I get more of God, how can God get more of me? And then then instead of thinking in my life as a Christian or somebody who's attempting to follow Christ, what, what do people have for me? How can people bless me, right? Instead, let's reframe it, what does God have for me? When we're thinking of the reward of God, we're thinking how can God get more of me and what does God have for me? Because Jesus sought the reward of God. There's a great example of this in John chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. The word says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, which was he fed the 5,000, they said, surely this is a prophet who has come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Whenever we see Jesus doing that, even though it doesn't say explicitly that He is praying. That is, in fact, what he's doing. When they record him withdrawing to a place by himself, he is praying. Sometimes the Word of God says Jesus went to the lonely places to pray. Why did Jesus withdraw to go and pray? Because, because he was being tempted by the people. They wanted to make him king. They wanted to lavish upon him treasures, status, and rewards. But that's not what Jesus came to do. I, I think that the, the enemy, the evil one, 
was present there, tempting Jesus. Because when Jesus, if you don't know this, Jesus went, before he began his earthly ministry, before he, he started doing what he started doing on earth, healing people and teaching, Jesus went to the desert for 40 days and he didn't eat and he didn't drink anything. He, he fasted and the devil came and tempted him. He, he tempted him with, with wealth and with power. He, he tempted him. And Jesus resisted. And then the word says that the devil waited until another opportune time to tempt him again. And I think he's tempting him here. What did Jesus do? He went to the room. He took a posture. He went to a room to activate that heart space, to protect himself from the superficiality of the world. Jesus did this. So Jesus says, when you pray, don't keep babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. Pray. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Here's another principle today. Prayer is not about getting God to hear you. It is knowing God is near you. Sometimes I've witnessed people make this mistake, like in public prayer or even sometimes in a small group of prayer. They may attempt to use prayer to invoke God's presence. God, we we ask you to be present here today. God, we call for you to come and be present with us today. But God, God is not... God is not waiting for us to invite him in to be present. God has already given his presence to you. Are are y'all tracking with you? You believe that? God is already present. When the the church gathers, God is present. The Holy Spirit is present. God is present here. We don't have to have a formulaic prayer. We don't have to repeat ourselves over and over again for God to be near. Because the promise of God is that he is present. The promise of God is that he is near. So we're not trying to get God to hear us. It's knowing that God is near us, that it's experiencing his affections with us. That's what prayer is. The reward is God near you. He already knows what you need, Jesus says. He already knows what you need. We ask and we receive because God is attentive to us. God is not deaf to us. He's not abandoned us. God isn't in some other planet or in some other solar system or in some other universe or multiverse or whatever. God is is present. God did not spin the globe and then vanish. God is here. God has an active presence in this world and in your life. And prayer is something that, that allows us to experience his nearness. Are you tracking with me? He's near. Experience his nearness through prayer. It's your reward. And then, I love this. He says, Jesus says, you don't have to babble on and on. And I know this to be true. Because you don't even have to say anything in prayer sometimes. Um, The Apostle Paul says in Romans 8 that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Ah, Jovan... I don't know how to pray. I'm not good at it. I'm tremendously unsatisfied in my prayers. What are you trying to do? I just don't know how to talk. I just don't know how to talk. Well, maybe it's not talking that you need to do with God. Maybe it's just tears. Maybe maybe it's not talking that you need to do with God. Maybe it's just groans. Maybe it's just sighs. Right? Maybe it's not talking that you need to do God. Maybe you just need to lay down. You just need to lay down in his presence. Because your, your words don't seem effective, and maybe they're not, because you're, you're thinking that it's like, i got to be this brilliant orator, or I have to get the words right, or I don't know what to say. But, but God says, I, I'm, I, when I'm near you, when I'm near you, when I'm within you, you don't know what you ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself can intercede through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Prayer is more than just words. 
prayer is a recognition that he's near and he'll fill the gap for you. He's attentive to you. Sometimes in the morning, I just, or in the middle of the night, I just, I just want to know that my wife is near. You know? I just want to know she's right next to me. You, you ever done that before? Just kind of reach out. I'm going to keep it G-rated, everybody, okay? Right? I just want to know she's near. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to snuggle until you just really want to snuggle, right? And then, and then you're like, you just want to be near them. No, no words are said because we're too groggy and sleep to say anything. You just, a touch, a snuggle, big spoon, little spoon, right? Just be near to each other. And I think that's how prayer is oftentimes. The words just don't work for us. But I guarantee you that if you practice what Jesus says, you, whenever, go to wherever, that private place, and you give that time, and you approach him with humility, I I promise you, you do what Jesus says. I only want to be seen by you, God. I promise you, you will experience the nearness of God. You will experience the joy of his presence. You will experience the satisfaction of being his child. You will. I guarantee you. It is something that has been a witness, a powerful witness for me in my life. That even sometimes when I don't feel like it, I still sit, I still open my prayer book, I still read, I still pray, and I'm always, always better for it. I'm always enlivened by it. And I may not know what all the outcomes may be. And and I think that's where we get it wrong too. Like there's some goal of it that's outside of the affections of God. Maybe you're not hitting those benchmarks, but I promise you, you give your time to the Lord in humility, and he will activate that heart space, and he will give you his full presence. I want you this week to do a couple things. I want you to participate in Pray 21. I want you to sign up and participate in 21 days of contemplative prayer. You can go to our website. You can find it very easily there. You need to do this. We do a fasting guide. We've done a reading through the New Testament this year. You need to practice this spiritual discipline of prayer. I want you to sign up now, today, to do it. And then I want you this week to find your secret place that will activate your heart space. You need to find your secret place to activate your heart space. The, the thing that's, that's yours and God's. All right? Find your secret place to activate that heart space. The thing that is going to allow you to experience the joy and the life and power through God. The place where only God sees and he gives you his reward. You must do that this week. It is vitally important for you to do so. Are you all with me? Say amen. You must do that this week. Will you stand with me? I'm going to invite the worship team to join us. We want to offer our prayers over you. If you're watching online, you can put your prayers in the chat. We want you to experience the joy that God has for you through the life of prayer. We want to pray over you. Please, you can text the number on the screen. You can indicate if you want it private. But most of all, we want you to know that we believe in a life of prayer here at our congregation. It's one of our values, worship and prayer. And we do believe that has the ability to change our lives dramatically and to keep us following Jesus in this world that can be so hard on us. Amen? Let me bless you with this. Holy Father, we thank you so much for your son Jesus. Father, we pray that you would activate our heart space today. We would find ourselves enjoying your full reward and embrace. You are near to us, God. Father, forgive us of the times where we have treated prayer self-righteously. And Father, allow us, Lord, to approach you with humility so that we can experience all that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all together we say, amen. Let's worship.